Um, so welcome everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to guys to have you guys on for our webinar with Nick Garcia. I'll let Nick introduce himself, but uh, we're really excited to have him. Um, he's going to be talking about flexible programming for the high school athlete and the uh, and and the the things that he does with his with his athletes and student and students. So um, over to you, Nick. And uh, yeah, we're really excited for the presentation. All right, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my goal today is just to go over some things that we do uh, with with my teams, my athletes, and uh, especially in this, this time where we can't train together. Uh, I was gonna go over three different options. And as we go along in the uh, presentation, um, we have questions, I believe you could uh, send them to uh, Cedric. Is that correct, Cedric? Yeah, so at the bottom of, the, of your screen, um, all the participants, you can see the, the Q&A uh, button. So any questions that you get, just uh, or that you have, just type them into that um, Q&A section and either myself and Bailey can answer them on the fly or we'll do a Q&A section at the end with Nick. Awesome, uh, let's get rolling here. First, I got a bunch of people to thank that has helped me throughout my, uh, my career as a coach. Uh, Glenn McAtee, first and foremost. Okay, he gave me an opportunity in college and track and field and became very successful at it because of him. Uh, Vern Gambetta has been a huge influence. Martin Bignister, who I have a podcast with um, called Hammer Media Podcast. Dan Lang, uh, Derek Evely, who's actually uh, from Canada. Uh, John Godina, Art Venegas, John Smith, and uh, Shannon Turley, who was a former strength coach at Stanford. Um, so we'll move on here. Okay, objective today. Uh, too many times I've gone to clinics and whatnot, and you know they give me theory and what they may do or what they could do, things like that. My objective here today is to give you what I do or what we do, uh, why we do it, and how we do it. Um, and I'm going to give you every exact detail that we use and, and how we go about business. And uh, it's important to me because that's the way I learn as well. I want to know what people do. I don't just want to hear theory and whatnot. All right, so starting in the training weeks, all right, I have a daily theme per week. Usually we train three times a week as far as the weight room goes. Um, we also have other days uh, where we have our field work. Um, that's also two to three days a week, but uh, we're just going to go over kind of the lifting part of it uh, today. So daily themes, um, I'm real big on training all three planes of motion, sagittal, frontal, and transverse, because that's how most games are played, you know, with the exception of track and field, you know, or, or – uh, However, the, the field events do do, you know, all three planes of motion, but most of the time the sprinting events and whatnot are pretty much sagittal plane based. Uh, but most other sports all take place on all three planes. So my objective is to cover those three planes in training, uh, whether it's throughout the day or mostly we have a theme day during the week that we hit all those planes. Okay, within the training sessions, there's three modules, uh, three parts per module. Okay, module one, we start off with an explosive or dynamic movement. You know, that could be a, you know, a clean an Olympic lift, a box jump, a, a dumbbell snatch, something in, in that area or that realm, um, something explosive. Uh, then we do hit our core work. So, for example, on a sagittal day, it'll be more on the sagittal plane, like an ab wheel or a medicine ball slam or something along those lines. On a frontal plane day, it will be a kettlebell windmill or a something we call side ups, something on the frontal plane. Um, and on the transverse day, you know, pretty much anything twisting. Um, as we move along here, injury prevention or individual needs. That's the third thing in this superset. And injury prevention, what I do is I screen all the athletes. And then what we look at are team trends. And if there's a team trend where they're, uh, you know, struggling in some area in that screen, we'll attack that as a team um, and if there's any individuals that may have another need, we'll attack that at the same time as well. Um, so the injury prevention stuff is based off screening. Um, and like I said, it's basically off team trends. So, uh, you know, usually we do have a team trend and, uh, Shannon Turley taught me this to attack the team trend first. And if anybody has any, any, any individual needs, we'll go ahead and attack that as well, either on their own time or, or during this time as well, they'll just have a special training plan. Module two, okay, so once again, this is all taking place the same day. Uh, those, the first modules, like, I guess you could call it tri set or super set it, however you wanna call it. Uh, module two is the same way, okay, but we now go to a lower body lift and normally on our sagittal plane day, we'll go, um, we'll go a, a, a squat, usually a front squat if we're cleaning on that day. 
um, a squat variation, a hex bar, deadlift variation, something like that. Upper body pulling variation. So if one day we do a vertical pulling movement, the next day we'll do a horizontal pulling movement to try and stay in balance. And finally, our mobility and flexibility movements um, within that. And, uh, you know, that's also individual needs, but I also look at the team trends as well, where we're, we're struggling at or we're de deficient at. Um, so moving along here to module three. Okay, this is the final module of the day of the training session. Okay, we have a hinging movement, mostly posterior chain, and it's, you know, usually kind of in the realm of the hamstring area. Um, I train all our hamstring movements, uh, all single leg. I'm not a big believer in Nordics or, or things like that because the way the hamstring functions in athletics or athletes is single leg most of the time. So that's how I train it. So we'll do some single leg RDLs. We'll do some single leg good mornings. We'll do uh, some lunging and reaching, uh, things along that, that realm um, to try and stay specific to the, the sport. Furthermore, um, I don't necessarily load them up extremely heavy. Um, we're doing this for, for health and not, not necessarily uh, to get super, super strong. Now, if you're an Olympic lifter or something like that, then I understand doing two legs. But as an individual sport athlete um, or a, a sport that, you know, is playing on one leg most of the time, that's how we train. Upper body pushing. So same concept as the upper body pulling. One day we'll do a vertical push. The next day we may do a horizontal push. So, you know, bench press versus a seated press or a jerk or, or something along that area. We try to keep the jerk in the explosive one in module one. But if something comes down to it where we don't maybe have time or we have a two day a week training week instead of a three day training week, we'll go ahead and put that jerk in the upper body pushing area. And we follow up with the mobility flexibility movement as well. Now, the mobility and flexibility movements, once again, they're off team trends or off maybe individual needs. But also, I'll look at what is coming next in the next module, and I may try and prepare the athletes for that uh, next module by using the mobility flexibility movement in that previous module. All right, so what, is, what are we talking about here, flexible programming? Um, it's finding a way to be productive when our environment is not optimum. Obviously, our environment right now is not optimum. When we send our athletes off on vacations, either Easter break or summer break or Christmas break, they may not have the facility that you need uh, to continue with the training that you've been doing. So we have to find a way to go ahead and make sure they're still maintaining and gaining uh, in their athleticism and their, their strength and their injury prevention. So um, I'm going to show you a few ways on how I've been doing it in the past and during this time while we can't train together. So applying it. So I came up with three options for my athletes. Okay. Based on the modules, I just uh, showed you um, module one, module two, module three, and the sagittal frontal and transverse days. Okay. So option one, option one is a complete setup or all the equipment is available to you that is needed in order to stay the original course. Okay. So what am I talking about? Bumper plates, squat stands, and bench. That's pretty much what you need um, to get things done. And you can find a way um, to do some other things, even if you don't have dumbbells or kettlebells, with, with a plate or with a barbell in some manner. Option two, okay, limited equipment. And what I mean by limited equipment, dumbbells, kettlebells, and or medicine balls. Um, somebody could always find a medicine ball. And if you're on vacation somewhere, or, um, you know, somebody always has a set of dumbbells laying around. Uh, but every hotel that I've been to has a set of dumbbells, usually up to at least 55. I've been to dump places where they're up to 100. So that's pretty much everything you need in order to be effective to train. Um, so that's just what I'm talking about when I'm talking about limited equipment. No equipment, okay? So that's the option number three. We have to assume that some athletes have nothing. They have no, they have no med balls at home or may have only a med ball at home. They have no weights, no dumbbells, and this is what they have. They have their park or, you know, maybe, you know, some kind of frame or bar outside they could use for pull-ups or inverted rows or whatnot. I know that on the street from uh, me, um, my wife and I will take a run or a walk down to the park, and as I go around the park, they have different – you know, they have monkey bars and they have pull-up bars and different things like that, inverted row bars that you can do your, your, do your movements on. So there's no excuses. Um, you can always find something to do. And option three is with no equipment. 
Okay, so option one, here's some examples that we'll do, okay? Uh, explosive movements, clean, snatch, pulls, okay? Like maybe box jumps aren't necessarily, uh, necess aren't necessary because we have the facility that we need or the equipment that we need. Core, what I do when I program for my athletes that are away right now is there are many options and I usually tell them I want something done on the sagittal plane on this day. And so what that would be would be an ab wheel or a, a slam or a, some type of crunch or V up or sit up, something on, on that area. I give them a choice and I give them options because uh, I don't always know what exactly what they're going to have. And then injury prevention, like I said, it's off injury, uh, individual needs. And uh, obviously there are many options there as well. Um, you know, whether it's a Cuban press or a single A squat or, or something like that, um, they can get that done and I either assign it individually or I'll give them choices as well. Option two, like we talked, or option one, module two, like we talked about earlier, squat variation, deadlift variation, um, upper pull, body pulling variations, like there are many options. So, you know, you got your rowing, you got your upright rows, you got your bent rows, single arm rows, um, you know, different things like that, bat wings. So I give them options of what they can do as long as they get something in. And I also explain to them that if it's horizontal one day, I want them vertical on another day. And then once again, flexible mobility is individual. And I also give them many options. Um, and we have a plethora of them that we use in our training. Okay, hinging movement, posture chain, usually single leg like we talked about earlier. Um, Upper body pushing variation, like I said, once again, many options. You got your bench press, dumbbell bench press, incline bench press, um, dips, uh, different things like that, uh, seated press, you know, standing press, jerks, push press. The list goes on and on. Like I said, if they have a facility or a, a full equipment at home, they could have no problem getting all that stuff done. And once again, flexibility and mobility, um, same as the last slide, individual needs, and once again, many options. Option two, okay, now here, this is where we have our dumbbells and our uh, kettlebells, maybe, maybe a med ball, okay, explosive movements, dumbbell jump strokes, dumbbell high pulls, dumbbell one-arm snatches, a med ball heaving series. Um, all this stuff is explosive. All this stuff, you can mimic the same movement patterns you do in an Olympic lift. It's just done with dumbbells. So, you know, it's not really a bad substitute. It actually, we use these as actual, the core lifts sometimes. Uh, core, once again, many options. And uh, injury prevention, we're going to follow the same pattern there through all the options. Um, they'll have their choices. Okay, lo uh, lower body, uh, goblet squat, sumo squat, dumbbell squat. You know, everything's done with kettlebells or dumbbells here. And the way I adjust the intensity, uh, there's not necessarily a way to adjust the intensity if they don't have heavy dumbbells or, or heavy. Um, kettlebells what I'll do is I'll adjust the volume and instead of doing you know if we have a sign five by five that day they may go five by ten or somewhere along those lines so I'll adjust the volume to make sure they're getting work in um, upper body pulling and flexibility same concepts but this time it has to be done with dumbbells or kettlebells so you got your dumbbell alternate press your dumbbell pressing your dumbbell jerks things like that uh, most of our uh, Single leg movements are done with dumbbells and kettlebells anyways. So this isn't much of a change for my athletes because that's what normally what we stick to. Um, so, you know, they kind of follow, follow the same path they've been following there. Uh, upper body pushing variation. You got your dumbbell benching. Um, dumbbell jerking, dumbbell push press, things like that. Finally, option three. This is the most challenging of all our options when we got to be flexible when we're programming. Okay, um, box jumps, jumping circuits, which I'll have videos of later that I'll go over. Med ball heaving and pressing series. So if we can just get a med ball, we can still get work done. Um, some argue that you need to Olympic lift in order to be successful. Um, I know many coaches and a lot of the professional athletes that train at my facility um, while they're in the off season, they don't even use Olympic lifts. They use, you know, uh, jumping circuits, they do their sprinting and they throw med balls and, and they're, idea that that's what they need to do so I would you know I'm along those same lines but my job is also to prepare the athletes for college so I prepare them by teaching them how to Olympic lift and so they have a good realm of everything 
uh, that they'll need to know in college. Um, could we get away with just doing box jumps, jumping circuits, uh, med ball heaving pressing series? I believe you probably could. Um, and if we had to, we would. Uh, core, like I said, you have you know many options, but the options become more limited based upon what equipment you have. You have a med ball, you can do lots of things, um, but you'll have to do most of it probably body weight if you have no equipment. Uh, injury prevention, that's once again, that could keep going with your mobility type movements, um, some, some black burns on the shoulder movement, things like that. We could still get work done. Module two. Okay, lower body is going to be all body weight variations because we don't have any equipment. So this time we really increase the volume and maybe go three by 20 on the, on the body weight squat. Um, and the reason for that is, is we want to keep a good tempo. Um, and uh, so we got a one per second on the uh, body weight squat, but we never sacrifice technique for speed. As long as our technique's good, we can start speeding it up more. But as soon as our technique goes bad and they're not hitting where they need to hit or getting the depth they need to hit, um, then we'll go ahead and uh, slow it down. Um, pulling variations. This becomes also challenging as well. You get your normal pull-ups, chin-ups, inverted rows. We do something called a towel tug of war. So uh, one athlete will be holding the towel, and another athlete holds the towel. Um, they have one in both hands. And they just slowly go back and forth and, and provide resistance for each other while the other one's pulling. Um, flexible mobility, that could just go on as, as planned. This is a little more challenging as well, the hinging movement, posterior chain stuff. We can go glute bridges or pelvic raises. I call them pelvic raises. Different variations. Go single leg, you can go double leg um, on the pelvic raises. Um, you know, you could even throw in some back stabilization movements like prone cobras, prone swimmers, and, uh, you know, a supermans or a fish out of water, depending on what you, you call them. And then, like I said, you can do Nordics if you have a partner, and if you have nothing else, that's great to do. Uh, but like I said, I'm not a, a great – and that's just my opinion. I'm just not a fan of doing them. We haven't had a great success with them. Pushing variations, uh, push-ups, dips, okay? If you have a med ball, you got your med ball pressing series, which I'll go over in a few. And then once again, flexibility and mobility. So, uh, so far, hopefully I give you some options so far to think about if, if you do have to assign uh, workouts for your athletes while they're away and they may not have anything or they may have limited equipment or they may have a full setup. Other options, okay, we talk about multi-throwing routines, okay? You can get very explosive throwing med balls, train the same uh, summation of forces as you do in your ath athletics or whatever athlete you're playing, whatever sport you're playing ankle, knee to hip uh, with your multi-throw routines, multi-jump routines, all your explosive movements. Furthermore, we use multi-jump routines uh, as some injury prevention type stuff, some ankle strength, things like that, single leg hops, which you'll see in a second. Um, you know, I work closely with the throwers and when we teach them how to rotate or when they glide into the center of the ring, uh, they, a lot of kids these days seem to just collapse right back onto their heel. And my philosophy is, is that they don't ride bikes anymore. They don't go outside and run anymore, or jump anymore for fun. You know, they're inside most of the time on video games or playing with their iPads, depending on what your environment's like. And uh, their strength is very poor. So we do a lot of these single leg movements and single leg hopping and things like that to increase their ankle strength to prepare them to be good throwers or be good sprinters, etc. Dumbbell complexes are great. You can uh, accomplish a lot of volume and a lot of weight. Um, just by doing dumbbell complexes. Uh, we normally assign dumbbell complexes at 20% of a person's body weight. You can start off with 10 if you're just beginning them because uh, they can get challenging, but you're doing 20% of your body weight if you're a 200 pound person. Um, you'll see in a second what I assign and we'll go over the, how much weight they accomplish per set and per, uh, per workout. Leg circuits. Leg circuits are great if you don't have any equipment. Um, a quick story about leg circuits. I had an individual named Ken Kenneth Boggs a few years ago, um, he was 165 pounds and he rock bottom squatted with no, no wraps, uh, 520, 535, I believe, 535. And one day we squatted heavy on Monday. On Thursday, we came back with just leg circuits. He worked up to three leg circuits, which I'll be, or sorry, five leg circuits, uh, which is roughly 300 plus reps uh, in a row with a 50 pound sandbag on his back with no rest. Um, so his time under tension was extremely high and it, obviously really did a great job for him in his squatting work. And finally, general strength circuits. I've been posting these on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, and on Facebook. 
uh, things that we do with no weight that are circuits that are more fitness based. And uh, we'll go over a few of those as well. Heaving. So once again, uh, I want to stress that this type of stuff can be done anywhere. Um, this is in my backyard that we're doing it. If you have med balls. All right. And here's, this is a front heave right here. Okay. Then we'll do a little bit more of a coordination movement. This is a lunge heave. This gets challenging for kids who've never done it before. They start in the lunge and finish in a lunge. And then we'll hit a heave for height, which is most similar to one of your uh, Olympic lifts. Just toss it as high as you can. And finally, ending up with a back heave. Now, the way I program this is we'll go uh, week one, one set of 10 of each movement. And on the lunge, it'll be five on each side. On week two, we'll go two sets of eight. Week three, we'll go three sets of six. And then the final week, we'll probably go back to one by 10 again. Um, a little less volume on that, on that fourth week. Moving to our pressing series, okay. Uh, chest pass from knees with follow through. Soccer throw, incline chest pass, shot put, and jumping chest pass, okay. So you wanna follow through here with the chest pass, okay. Followed by a soccer throw. Followed by incline chest pass. So we're making sure we try and throw 45 degrees plus as far as the angle goes. Shot put right, shot put left, and finally, the jumping chest pass, we're firing as hard as we can, as aggressively as possible. All right, so um, obviously I have a set of med balls, but you know, you know, the way you would do it is you would do just, you know, if, you, if I assigned one set of 10, you would do chest, 10 chest pass from knees. Then you would do 10 soccer throws, then you would do 10 incline chest pass, 10 shot puts, actually that would be five on each side, and then 10 jumping chest passes. Total body throws, okay? This is another series that we'll do um, off a single leg. Uh, this is more of a, like a kind of a single leg RDL and throw. I just call it single leg squat and throw. Um, the first one here. So you get your single leg work in. We're really big on single leg because that's how most sport is played. Single leg key for height. This is more like a jerk right here, squat and throw. And finally, Key for height. Multi jumps. Okay, this is another explosive thing that we'll do. And what we'll normally do is we'll do a uh, jumping day on a Monday and a Tuesday. I'm sorry, Monday and a Thursday, and then we'll do a sprinting slash multi throw day on a um, uh, Tuesday and Friday. So Monday, Thursday is more jumping. Tuesday, Friday is more. Uh, sprinting and uh, multi throws days. So this is a circuit that we'll do. It's, it's fitness based. We'll do this at the beginning of a training cycle. Okay. So that's a star jump. Um, higher volume. Power skips. Ankle, ankle, basic ankle hops, like I said, more for injury prevention, ankle strength. Power skips for distance. Some speed skaters. Once again, we're trying to go multi-plane here in the jumping as well. Single leg hops forward. And on the skips for height and skips for distance, um, and then moving the stuff that are moving, locomotive modes, local motion movements. Uh, we will do like 30 yards, single leg butt kicks right there. Okay. Uh, so once again, we program it the same way we do the med ball stuff. Uh, first week, one by 10, second week, um, two by eight, third week, three by six. And then that fourth week is usually up in the air. We'll usually drop back down to one by 10 as we go along here. So once again, um, the distance stuff, the stuff where you're moving, that's usually about, 20 to 30 yards. Our second circuit, so if we'll do uh, circuit one on Monday, we'll do this on Thursday. This one's a little more challenging. Okay, lunge jumps. 
Then we'll do long jumps. And once again, we'll go 30 yards, 20 to 30 yards here, depending. Followed by knees to chest. Followed by single leg hops backwards. We call these low amplitude jumps. We're not jumping far. Heels to butt. Split uh, two sumo stance jumps or straddle squat jumps are also called. Left, left, right, right, low amplitude. And finally, lateral squat jumps on the front plane. Moving on. Dumbbell complexes, okay? So like I talked about earlier, um, you can get a great, great uh, workout in with this, great training day. Um, there's, there are four movements, and normally uh, we do six reps per movement on complex number one. So I'm not really a great math guy, but uh, you do six reps. Uh, if you do 40 pounds, uh, if you're a 200-pound guy, so six reps at a high pull, six reps alternate press, six foot – six reps squat and six uh, reps bent row. Okay, you're looking at uh, six reps per thing. So times uh, 40 pounds, it's 240 pounds. And then we go three to five sets. So multiply that by three sets, okay, or, or five sets, okay. And it, there's a big amount of volume there, big amount of tonnage. So here it is, high pull, just like the clean high pull, alternate press. Squat, and finally you finish with a bent row. All right, now our goal here is one to one work rest ratio. So however long it takes you to complete it, okay, you go ahead and uh, take that amount of rest. So if it takes 46 seconds to complete, you take 46 seconds rest. Optimally, we'd have a partner we'd be training with. So we would go, you know, one to one. So however fast he gets done, I'm up next. When he gets done, the next, the next guy's up, okay? So uh, this is done, be done quickly, okay? But once again, without sacrificing technique. Um, week one, three sets. Week two, um, four sets. Week three, five sets. And depending on where we're at in the season or what we're trying to accomplish, week four could be five sets or it can drop back down to three sets. Here's dumbbell complex number two. We would normally do dumbbell complex number one on a Monday. We would come back on a Tuesday, I'm sorry, on a Thursday with complex number two. Less volume here. We would do three each arm here, a one arm snatch, okay? Three push press and three squats. And once again, one to one work rest ratio. This will be done a little faster and once again, three sets, four sets, five sets. And on that fourth week, it's up to you depending on how the athlete looks and what you're trying to accomplish. Leg circuits. Okay. Now this is original leg circuit. It was developed by Gambetta, Vern Gambetta. Um, we program these half leg circuits are 10 squats, five lunges each side, five step ups each side and five jump squats. Full leg circuits are 20, 20, um, 20 and 10. So large amount of volume here, long time, time under tension. Our squat, we want one per second. Our lungs, we want one per one and a half seconds. Dynamic step ups, when we go get to it, you'll see that I want full leg extension. I tell the kids that imagine there's a rope about four inches above your head at full leg extension and you wanna hit that rope every time with your head. And like I said, Kenny Boggs did this on Thursdays, squatted heavy on Mondays, did this on Thursdays and he had a really good squat result. Um, and he did full leg circuits with a 50 pound sandbag on his back. So if you add up that tonnage, uh, it's, it's pretty big. So here we go with the movements. Okay, squats, one per second. Okay, you do 10 of those for half circuits. Lunges, one per one and a half second. Our objective here is to lunge out as far as your leg is long. Dynamic step ups. Finally, jump squats. Now for you track coaches out there, um, these are extremely, extremely good for, uh, 400, 800 meter runners. They're good for everybody, but 400, 800 meter runners, because the circuit takes about when you're doing half circuit, it takes about, you know, between 40 to 60 seconds. 
And uh, that's about how long it takes for, you know, quarter miles, good quarter miles to run is about 40, you know, 5, 46, 47 seconds. If you're elite, obviously 43 and 44. <clears throat> but it's very specific. They start getting booty locked and stuff like that, like they experience during races. Um, so it's real effective for that as well to prepare them. Now, I figured like since I'm a th three plane guy, I like to train on all three planes of circuit. I came up with two other leg circuits that we do that we incorporate it. We may do, uh, depending on the training cycle, we do may do a uh, sagittal one, the normal one on Monday. We may do a frontal one on Wednesday and then a transverse one on Friday. So this is what the frontal one would look like. Start with a Cossack squat. And once again, you can use weight by using a sandbag, uh, followed by a lateral lunge. Followed by a lateral dynamic step up. Followed by speed skaters. All right, same, same type of programming, three sets, four sets, five sets throughout the weeks. Okay, and then, you know, half leg circuits um, and full leg circuits are, halves are 10, 10, 10, and five each side. And then fulls are 20, 20, uh, 20. And if you're doing 20, just 10 on each side for the speed skaters. <clears throat> now here's a, a rotational leg circuit. I call this a rotational squat. Followed by a rotational lunge. Uh, it's important to keep that foot, front foot planted and not let it rotate because if you rotate it, it'll just turn into a, a forward normal lunge. So keep it planted forward. Dynamic rotational step up. That's a little challenging. Okay, and then 360 jumps. All right. So there are three leg circuits that we do. Now, these general leg circuits are primarily done on recovery days. So if we train on Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, let's say, we'll do this maybe on a Wednesday and do active rest on a Thursday. Um, but uh, right now, these are kind of getting a lot of hits on my Instagram and Twitter and whatnot because uh, no one has anything to train with. So um, I program these in. Each one usually gets more challenging as far as difficulty goes. And... Uh, um, as you move along, so for example, this one's called Ray. If Ray is challenging for you the first week or two, um, you just jump it to four sets the second week. Um, but if it's not, then we'll move on to the next one called, uh, um, what is it called? Kenobi, okay, Kenobi will be the next one. As they go along, they get harder and harder. So we got our squad here, okay. And we'll come back to your questions uh, in a sec. Our easy push-ups. And to get all these, I post one every day. You can get them on Instagram, on my Instagram, or on my Twitter. Easy push-up, okay. Then we got uh, alternate cross crunch. An important thing alternate cross crunch is you pivot off your elbow and you don't put your hands behind your head. You just put your hands behind your ear, okay, so you're not pulling on your head. I try to show every angle on this one so you can see me pivoting off the elbow. Prone swimmer. Reverse lunge. Normal push-ups. Seated tucks, and then we'll finish up with some prone cobras. Important thing here, your palms start facing up. They turn down as you pop up, and their hands are always off the ground. 
So we try and cover everything here, back stabilization, core, lower body, upper body, etc. Our next one's called Kenobi. This one gets a little more challenging. Jump squats here, no counter movement. So not using your arms, okay? Right to regular push-ups. Right to a V-up. Followed by bridges. Now bridges, I'm not necessarily real mobile in my shoulders. Um, you wanna try and get a little higher than I do. But uh, as long as you get your head and your shoulders off the ground, you're getting better. All by burpee. Decline push-ups. Alternate cross V-up. These are called Tor's Rolls, okay? Uh, Tor Gustafsson, a Swedish hammer thrower, 80 meter hammer thrower, taught me these. They're challenging, one side's always harder than the other side. Uh, as you get more advanced, you can hold a med ball and make sure your hands and your feet never touch the ground as you roll. Skywalker, okay? Prisoner squats. Exchange push-ups. Leg raises, leg lifts, whatever you want to call them. Single leg pelvic raise. Back to our caustic squat here. Uh, deep push ups. Reverse crunch. and Supermans, or fish out of water as I call them both. Final one here is Yoda. This one's the most challenging here. Bottom halfway up, bottom top squats. Exchange push-ups with the clap. V up with a hold. Then we have modified kip ups. And you're not actually kipping up, you're just kind of rolling up and trying to get, some people call them candlesticks because everybody has different names for them. And eventually you want to progress to a real kip up if you can. Lateral low walks. Back to exchange with the clap. Uh, windshield wipers, supine windshield wipers. And then pelvic raise with legs extended and supported. All right, guys, that's what I got for you today. Um, any questions? I know, I know there was some sent here. I'm not quite sure how to, here's my Twitter handles and whatnot. 
Awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks, Nick. Like, just awesome to get such a technical insight um, into, you know, what you're doing with your athletes and what you're programming and prescribing. Um, we've got a heap of questions. So what me and Bailey will do is we'll just kind of, we'll, we'll just tag team um, reading one out each um, alternating fashion. Um, and then, yeah, you can just kind of roll away with them. So I'll read, uh, I'll read the first one. So um, why, why do you put the power exercises at the end of the circuits? What, uh, what circuit are we talking about? Is my I, think, I, I think it was the leg circuits when he, when he asked him. Uh, that's the way I learned it from Vern Guevara. Um, I don't necessarily uh, question anything Vern says. Um, but, uh, yeah, the jump squats at the very end, that's how he taught it to me. That's how I use it. Um, I understand your question. It makes complete sense to me. Um, but uh, that's, that's how we use it. I and mean, that's how I've always done it. And that's how we had a good results with it. So um, I can ask Vern, though, why he wouldn't do that. Absolutely. All right. Perfect. Next, uh, next question here. This is one we are uh, really, really happy somebody asked. Or what, what are the benefits to uh, working with push and how does it fit into your, uh, your module, modular uh, methodology? Well, what happens is we have, um, first I'll answer how it fits in. So we have an iPad every rack and uh, the athletes have, have their files on, on, on push and whatnot in their, in their portal. And <clears throat> the way it fits in is we use them on majority, or if not all, the, the main lifts. Like, so, for example, in our module, we'll start with a clean. We'll uh, move to a module two, which would be a lower body lift, which would be a squat, and then we'll finish with a bench. And so they will use those on those three different movements for that day. Um, so they're not necessarily going to use them on the other lifts, uh, but we do use them on the core lifts right now as we get more, uh, let's see, experience with it and the athletes get more experience with it. We may use them for other things, but that's how we use them right now. And uh, as far as working with push, it's been awesome. It's been great. Uh, they're always improving what they're trying to do. I know they got some good stuff coming out that I'm extremely looking forward to. Um, I've also got some charts sent to me uh, by them that uh, were pretty much dead on on what velocities uh, relate to what percentages of a lift. So, um, you know, those have been big for us. And the reason why I enjoy using uh, velocity-based training is because especially during seasons like let's say a uh, brutal season, like a football season or a rugby season, something like that. If you program 85% of the day after or 75% of the day after their 75% is going to be more like 90% because they're feeling beat up. So um, it allows you to, I guess we want to say to audio regulate them from overtraining. So their 75% day is basically based on speed. So if you're not moving at that speed, it's too heavy and we can keep them from overtraining in that sense. Perfect. Um, so I'll read out Alexandra's question now. So are the modules one to three that you, uh, that you outlined in order of importance? Um, or do you think that module one is more important than the other two and so on? Well, no, I don't think anything is more important than the other thing. Um, now, if I had a choice of doing anything ever, it'd only be a, like either a snatch or a, or a clean because um, you benefit everything from that. You get your squat in with that. If you're, you know, if you're doing full cleans or full snatches. Um, however, uh, the way I was taught and the way I've always done things is start with something faster moving, more explosive and move more towards the throat, the slower type movements. And uh, that's the way I do it. That's the way I always program it. That's the way I found that most coaches do it. And that's the way I, I do it that way. Now is a squat any more important than a clean, any more important than a bench? Um, I don't believe so. They all have their, their places in athletics and their places in your training uh, session. So um, I just like to do in that order because that's the way I was taught and that's the way we've, we've done it. All right. So uh, Nick, how do you match up the explosive LB and hinge lifts with plain emphasis? If, if so, how so? Okay. That's a good question. Okay. So not always uh, is it possible to do the plain type stuff. Um, for example, let's take, uh, you know, the pulling and, and, and pushing stuff. Like there's push-pull movements you can do that are on the transverse plane and things like that. Um, however, sometimes you just try to do it the best you can. And if you don't have one of those movements, then you can't necessarily do it. You just kind of stick with the same sequence. It may have to be on the sagittal plane. However, for the explosive movements, um, what we'll do is we'll put a band on them and attach it to a rack. And we'll have them do banded speed skaters or banded lateral hops. Uh, for our frontal plane stuff, for our uh, explosive uh, 
movements on the transverse plane, we do something called a rotational snatch. And if everybody's interested in seeing how we do that, I will send that to you or a rotational high pull. Um, those are the type of movements that we'll do on, on plane type movements. Um, now, also one thing I wanna say is that when we do follow those themes, the thing is, is, is it's easy, a little bit easier to do things with dumbbells as far as rotational, um, rotational high pulls or a rotational snatch with a landmine attachment. Um, so those are necessarily may not be as heavy. They're just explosive on those planes. But our main explosive movements are with, done with the barbell, and that would be the snatch to clean the jerk. Um, however, we do do our explosive movements on the other planes. It's just not as loaded as heavy and not as aggressive. Great answer. Thanks, Nick. Okay, so the next one is um, how are you programming speed development into your current remote programming situation? Hold in strength maintenance or even improving strength qualities? Uh, so I got the first part of that. So is how am I incorporated into being away basically? Yeah. Sorry. So how are you programming speed developments into your current remote programming situation and what role does it play in strength maintenance or even improving strength qualities? Well, um, as far as how am I, how am I, uh, assigning it right now is they'll, they'll lift on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, at least the stuff that I've, I've sent them. And on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday are our running days. Now, Tuesday is more of a short sprint acceleration type day. Um, and on Thursday is more of a longer type sprint day. So those are like, you know, 150s or 200s on that day. And then on, on Saturday, we do more of a recovery day. So they'll, they'll do a light jog and do some strides. Uh, so that's how I've incorporated it into that right now. Uh, we can't get necessarily too advanced with the high school kids because um, necessarily they don't necessarily, excuse me, they don't necessarily understand um, how fast they're supposed to be running all the time and, and what, you know, uh, buildup is or, or things like that. So that's how I've incorporated it. In. We do it three times a week, one short for acceleration, one a little bit longer, and then one recovery day. As far as strength qualities go, um, you know, I believe that, you know, you pulling sleds or being towed can increase those strength qualities. Like we're big on pulling sleds. We're also big on, on pushing sleds for acceleration. And then we're also, you know, later in the year, we're doing our max velocity type stuff, we tow guides. So I do think 100% that it does help strength qualities. Um, I've also noticed, um, I've been fortunate to work with uh, three high school kids that have ran 10, three, eight and under. So we had Kalfani Muhammad that ran 10, 22. We had Rodney Glass who ran 10, 33. And um, who was the fourth? Oh, uh, I forget the third one. Anyway, oh, Christian Grubb, uh, he ran like 10.40. Um, but I've never seen really a weak sprinter. Like those guys could go in there and, and clean a good amount of weight. They could squat a good amount of weight. Um, so sometimes I would argue that those guys are strong for being fast. And I don't necessarily think they're, they're fast from being strong, if that makes sense. Great answer. Uh... Do you monitor the fatigue of your athletes daily and in what way a vertical jump or drop jump? It depends on what sport it is. Um, as far as mounting fatigue, you can do that very easily by using the bar velocity step with push. Cause it's telling them like, okay, if you're doing 50 kilos today and uh, it's moving at 1.2 meters per second. And if you're doing 50 kilos the next day and it's moving at, you know, 0.8, then obviously you're probably fatigued. Now, I do it mostly using the Dr. Bondarchuk system. Now, what that means is we test something every day, but it's the same thing every day for a cycle. For example, um, for the throwers, we test their throw every day. Uh, they have a throwing uh, assignment with a different way to implement. So they might throw, if you're a, a college athlete, you'll throw a 16 pound shot or a 7.26 kilo uh, shot, a 18 pound shot, or eight kilo, and then a, maybe a six kilo shot. And so each day we'll take their best throw and mark that down and uh, compare. And uh, as we go along, we can see where they're in their low, low valley and in their, their high peak as we go along. That's how we monitor their fatigue. Now, if we're doing a different sport, we may do a vertical jump on the jump mat, or we may do a standing long jump. There are two different things that we can do in that sense. But most of the time, that's how we do it. I know if you have a lot of time, if you're using this system with a uh, sprinter, they could do like a 10-yard sprint uh, or a 10-meter sprint, something like that. 
Um, but I monitor it for sure with the kids on the Dr. B system. And we monitor it maybe not as closely, but we do monitor it with using bar velocity. Awesome. And um, so are you good for two more questions, Nick? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're good. Great. Um, okay, so the next one is from Kyle. Um, do you tend to monitor peak or average velocities uh, during movements, strength movements? Well, I monitor both. And I monitor the average on squat, bench, hex bar deads. I monitor, monitor peak on clean and uh, in the Olympic snatch. And the reason for that is because I learned this from Brian Mann. Um, squat and bench and deadlift, they're less ballistic. And if you have some kind of impingement somewhere, um, it's not going to affect you as much as if you have a problem cleaning or snatching as far as your, your rack position and things like that. So usually the average speed will be a great telltale for a squat, a bench, and a hex bar deadlift because it's not as complex of a movement. Clean, people have different impingements, different spots, different mobility issues. So what we're looking for is the peak speed um, of that movement. Therefore, uh, so we do peak uh, speed on the Olympic lifts and we do average speed on the um, power lifts, squat, deadlift, bench. Perfect, sounds great. Yeah, that's usually what we recommend too, so that's spot on. Um, okay, so the last one. Um, so for track specific work, do you still use that kind of, that sagittal frontal and transverse uh, focus on the days? Um, or do you use small frequent dosages of frontal transverse work kind of spread across the week? Well, here's how, well, here's how we'll do it. It's, it's a little bit more of a complex question um, as far as how I, I program different teams. But for example, what we'll do is we'll take that uh, for the tracks. Well, you know, they're, they're going to clean and they're going to snatch. Okay. And they're going to jerk often. Okay. Now, We'll take the uh, sagittal type stuff. We'll put that, sa uh, and, or the, sorry, the frontal type stuff. We'll put that into a injury prevention area. Like we'll go uh, lateral lunge in the injury prevention in module one. We'll do something like that. We'll still stick with our main sagittal lifts that produce the power, produce the strength, but we'll start incorporating frontal and transverse type stuff within the other areas of the modules, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's perfect. Um, Okay, so what we'll do is we'll wrap it up just now. We, we've actually got heaps of, uh, heaps of people writing in to see if you would do a second presentation at some stage too. Um, so maybe we can have a chat about that. Um, the information was, was amazing. Um, I'm sure everyone got a lot out of it. Uh, we want to thank you for your time, Nick, um, and obviously thank everyone for um, signing in to this PUSH webinar. We'll be emailing out a follow-up, um, including a recording of this video. Uh, so yeah, so stay tuned for any more webinars that we've got lined up. It looks like we're going to have one again next Friday. So stay tuned and thank you again, Nick, for your time. Hey, uh, can I answer one more, please? Sure. sure. So, uh, I said this one, when analyzing the jump during monitoring, which variable is the most important to you? Ground yeah. contact time or jump speed or altitude? For me, it's going to be altitude. And here's why. We have all these different technological things that, that we have access to. And I'm fortunate enough to be at a school that has a great budget. And I can use different things and do different things. My choice was to go with push and even bar velocity. Now, we have options to global positioning systems, things like that, how much mileage you're doing during a day, during practice, how much load, et cetera. Um, and as far as the jumping goes, I have jump mats and things like that. Now, in my opinion, you're going to need an extra team sometimes to handle all the, the global positioning system stuff, okay, the GPS stuff you know, to handle all the different data of all the different stuff. So I try to keep, all as simple, keep it as simple as possible. So all I look at when testing is I look at the altitude and it just keeps it simple for me. I, you know, I'm not saying that's wrong or right or whatever. Okay. But that's how I do it to keep it simple. Great. Thank yeah. you. Fred. Thank you so much, Nick. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure working with you and we're hoping to uh, continue discussions for uh, practical applied VBT, maybe part two. So and thank if you, you guys very much. Have any, if you guys have any more questions that are listening, uh, like send me a message on Instagram, email me, whatever you want to do, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. That's perfect, Nick. Thanks very much, Matt. Yes, sir. Thank uh, you. All right. We want to thank everyone again for signing in. And yet, stay tuned for the next webinar. And thanks again. See you later, guys. Stay safe.